We come this evening to the last of our questions in this I Need an Answer series, one that's been a, a little bit protracted. I didn't envisage it been drawn out quite as long as this, but in the providence of God, we come this evening to this, our last question in, in this series, designed to help us explain our, our faith to an inquisitive world, explain our faith to your children, to your families, to stand over it, to understand that it is rational, it is sensible, it is defensible, and to help us to defend it. Our final question, is, as you know this evening, is can't we leave the Bible's attitude to sex in the dark ages where it belongs? There are two very different sexual ethics in the world. By sexual ethics, I simply mean beliefs on sex and, and how the gift of sex can be enjoyed. There are two very different kinds of, of beliefs within these two belief systems. But ultimately, when you boil them all down from all those different varieties and, and strands of, of belief about sex, you can boil them down into just two categories or schools of thought. The first of these is the sexual ethic or the attitude to sex and sexuality that is laid down in the Bible. It says that God, having created man and woman, similar but distinct, sharing the same humanity and the same image of God, but differing in all manner, whole different number of ways, being designed by God specifically to, to complement each other uh, and, and in some ways complete each other, a complementing and, and a completion that is seen in marriage and experienced in marriage, the coming together of one man and one woman in a lifelong covenant, it's, that's a, a lifelong committal to each other, committing themselves to each other exclusively, exclusively for life. And that sex is a gift of God to be enjoyed only within this marriage relationship between one man and one woman. That's the biblical ethic on sex and sexuality. And the second attitude or ethic towards sex is that it can be enjoyed whenever people want, however people want, with whoever people want, without any restriction or restraint whatsoever. That is it in a nutshell. It's very much the prevailing attitude of, of our culture and, and the I was going to say majority, all of the, the cultures, I think, of the world today, a culture of one-night stands, a culture in which sex is bought and sold, it's, it's transactional, it's used as a commodity to get what you want, where promiscuity and adultery and, and unf unfaithfulness are the norm, where people live together before they get married or instead of, of getting married, just live together where divorce rates are on the rise among those who do choose to get married, where lifestyles and activities condemned by God's word that only a few years ago, it wouldn't have been spoken about by our society. Yes, some people practice them, but it they wouldn't have been spoken about uh, publicly. Oh, throuples, new word that, that I learned over the course of the past fortnight. Open marriages, spouse swapping, orgies, and homosexuality, things that, that would never have been spoken about, practiced maybe, but never spoken about, are now spoken about with pride in our sexually liberated society. A society in which the sexual ethic of the Bible is viewed as outdated and having no place whatsoever other than the history books. And those who hold to the ethics of the Bible, Christians, who hold to the ethics of the Bible, though just by calling yourself a Christian doesn't automatically, sadly, automatically mean that you do hold to the ethics, the sexual ethics of the Bible, but Christians who do hold to the sexual ethics of the Bible, we are ridiculed, we're chastised, we're told, come on, get with the times, it's the 21st century, we've moved on, we're more civilized and far more enlightened than the days whenever that nonsense was written. And the church is told to adapt or die. That's the message. Adapt or die. Fall into line with the beliefs of our modern culture. Accept them and promote them. Or be swept into oblivion by the unstoppable wave of societal change. That's what we're told. And it's this whole area. Sex, sexual identity, 
that we're thinking about this evening. How are we as Christians to respond to that, to these changes, calls for us from the world to adapt or die? You know, why? How can we continue to hold to the Bible's teaching in areas of morality, particularly the areas of morality that we're looking at this evening, sex and sexuality? Why do we continue to hold to what the Bible says? How do we continue to hold to it, live by it, and confidently, but, but graciously and gently defend it and promote it without reticence, without embarrassment to the world around us? And tonight, we're going to respond to society's assertion that the, the sexual ethics, the Bible's attitude to sex and sexuality should be consigned to the dark ages where it belongs by looking at, at a number of truths, four truths, by which we uphold and defend, promote the Bible's teaching on sex. The first of these is that God is God. God is God. Simple. God is God. As with a lot of the, the talks in our series, we're building here on things that we've already looked at, we've thought about before, the existence of God and the truth of His Word. The Bible is the, the truth, the, the Word, the, the revelation of Almighty God. And if you have any questions, on those, uh, doubts on those matters, listen again to the first two talks on, on this series. The sexual ethic of the world is, is based very simply on the rejection of God either rejecting God completely, there is no such thing as God, the idea of God is a nonsense, don't be so silly, or else rejecting the God of the Bible. That's the, the basis on which the sexual ethic of the world is based, the rejection of God. And in rejecting God altogether, or rejecting the God of the Bible, you not only reject Him as a person, as a thing, you reject His Word. You reject His ethics, what He says is right or wrong, how He says you should live. How he says sex is to be, to be used and treated, enjoyed. And by rejecting God, by rejecting what God says is, is right and wrong, what you're left with to determine matters of, of morality and, and ethics, what's right and what's wrong, very simply, it's yourself, your own opinion. It's all you're left with. But the opinion of society, collective opinion of society, what's right or wrong is simply what you think is right or wrong or what the prevailing opinion of society is as to what's right or wrong at any given time. And we're left, by rejecting God, we're left with a system of morality that changes as our opinions change. Changes like the wind. But as we saw it in our study, very first study in our series, there is a God. And we know there's a God. And we saw in our second study, the Bible is His Word. It's not a fairy tale. It's not fanciful. It's not fiction. It's not make-believe. The Bible is the Word of Almighty God, His revelation of Himself to mankind. It's rational. It's understandable. It's defendable. It's true. And that being on the case, there is a God, and the Bible is God's Word. We are not left on our own to come up with our own system of, of ethics or morality, what's right and what's wrong. What we feel or what we think, what we want to be right or wrong. God. The God who made you. The God who has every right having made you to tell you how he, as your creator, wants you to live. He has given us a system of ethics and morals for us to follow. And you mightn't like the system of ethics that he's laid down. You know, as sinful men and women, we reel against all his commands at, at some stage in our lives, everything God does, but whether we like them or not, whether we agree with them or not, whether we accept them or not, it doesn't change the fact that they're the morals, they're the ethics laid down by the God who made us. And a culture that says today, no one has the right to tell me what to do. You have no right to tell me what to do. We say God has the right to tell us how to live. Having made us, created us, he has every right to tell us how he wants us to live. We are his to do as he directs and as he pleases. 
You see, the sexual ethics of, of the Bible, they aren't the brainchild of a repressive religious institution, as we're told today. They haven't been thought up by some ancient government guided by outdated ancient biblical principles. They're not the, eth the ethics of some ancient relationship counselor or marriage guidance counselor or sex therapist or, or lycra clad lifestyle coach. The ethics laid down in the Bible, they're not even the, the promptings or concerns of, of well-meaning parents. They're the sexual ethics given to us by God. God. This is God's plan. How God says we're to live. How God says we're to behave and interact in this whole area of sex and sexuality. And as Christians, we don't disagree with the sexual ethics and, and attitude of our culture just because we don't like it, because it's not to our taste, because we find it a little bit icky, because it's not what we're used to. This isn't traditional. This is very different from, from what our culture had before. We say it's wrong, not on those bases. We say it's wrong because God is God. God is God, and God has a right to tell us how he wants us to live in every area of life. And he has. In his word. God is God. The second truth by which we defend and, and promote the Bible's attitude to sex is that God is clear. God is clear. Now, God's word isn't ambiguous. It's, it's crystal clear. Sex, God says, is to be enjoyed only, only within the marriage relationship. And sex in any other uh, setting than, than that of marriage, one man, remember, one man, one woman, in this lifelong covenant commitment to each other, exclusive commitment, sex in any other environment other than that, it's off the cards. It's not to be engaged in. In Genesis 2, we read, how God says through Moses, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's a relationship in which sex is to be engaged in and enjoy marriage. It was a teaching affirmed by Jesus in Mark 10. From the beginning of creation, Christ said, God made them male and female. Therefore, quoting Genesis chapter 2, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, Christ said, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And time doesn't allow us to go through every last reference in, in, in the Bible uh, that where God condemns uh, and, and, and outlaws um, sex in, in, uh, in any other environment, any other relationship. But, but the events in, in Lot's life recorded for us in, in Genesis 19, where, where in, in Sodom, men came and, and they, they wanted to have sex with, with, with Lot. And um, that, that's why the, the fire and brimstone fell on, on Sodom and Gomorrah because of that, that, that sexual immorality. Exodus 20, God gives his, his Ten Commandments, the one of which very clearly, you know, do not commit adultery. Leviticus 18, where, where God lays down specific instructions about sex. Judges 19, where again, the men of Benjamin are, are condemned for wanting to have sex with a man who is traveling through their town and accepted hospitality in their town, and the men of the town want to have sex with him. And whenever they refused, what did they do? They raped his concubine. All the passages in, in the New Testament that, that expressly condemn fornication, that's sex outside of marriage, expressly condemn sexual immorality, any sex outside of, of that ordained by God, adultery, homosexuality, all those passages make the, the Bible's ethic on sex abundantly clear, crystal clear. You know, and, and we can enter into all sorts of, of linguistic gymnastics, all sorts of, of hermeneutical and, and exegetical gymnastics to try and, and say otherwise and, and argue otherwise. Oh, yeah, marriage, yeah, definitely. It is a relationship uh, that, that God has ordained in which sex is to be enjoyed. But it's not the only one. God, yeah, God focuses on it clearly, but it's not the only one people will try and say. 
the condemnation of homosexuality in, in Genesis 19 and in Sodom and Gomorrah or Judges 19. Well, they say, well, that's just, that's confined to non-consexual sex. These men were, were, were trying to have sex with other, other men, rape, rape other men, and that's the only homosexual sex that, that God's against. Condemnation of homosexuality in the New Testament is, well, that's confined to promiscuous homosexual activity. It, it's, it's not forbidding, you know, loving, committed homosexual relationships. That's what we're told. But no matter how hard, no matter how hard you try to twist God's word to suit your ends, you can't avoid the Bible's clear, unambiguous teaching. Sex is only to be engaged in the marriage relationship between one man and one woman, and anything else the Bible says, God says, it's fornication, it's sexual immorality, it's sin, and it's wrong. Some people argue that, that these passages in the, in the Bible condemning sec, hope, the sexuality and uh, sexual immorality, they will, they're just reflecting the attitude at the time in which the Bible was written, uh, society's disapproval of these practices. That's all it's doing. You know, society disapproved of, of sex outside of, of, of marriage, so the Bible is reflecting that. That's nonsense. The Old Testament and New Testament cultures in which the Bible was written they were sexually permissive, sexually deviant. All sorts of, of sex outside of marriage was, was permitted and, and, and lauded and practiced. The Bible's teaching on sex and sexuality was as countercultural in those days as it is today. Okay, some people say, well, um, then the, the Bible's teaching on, on sexual ethics, it simply reflects the personal opinion of the, the writers of these passages. The, the Bible, it was written, they say, entirely by men who were sexually repressed homophobes. That ignores the, fa the, the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. It's not man's Word. It's God's Word. Men wrote what God wanted them to write as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's not the Word of man. This is not their opinion, their personal opinion uh, about sex and sexuality. This is God's opinion. God's Word. Some try to get around God's clear commands by saying, yeah, but love is love. You know, we're told to love. Love is love. However it's expressed, you know, in all its forms, all forms of love are equally valid. And again, that ignores the fact that God has clearly told us in his word what love is. He defines it. He tells us what love is. And, and the expressions of love that are expressions of real, genuine love. And anything that falls outside of that definition, God's definition of love, and his approved expressions of love, it isn't love. Not all love as we think of love is love. God's word is clear. God's word is unambiguous. He has told us clearly how the gift of sex is to be enjoyed. And any attempts to explain away God's word, his clear commands are just that. They are attempts to explain away and get around God's clear commands. God is clear. God is God, and God is clear. The third truth by which we uphold and we promote the, the Bible's teaching on sex is that God is changeless. God is changeless. We change. We change on a daily basis. You no, know, we, we, we change uh, as, a, as a wind blows is um, an, an expression. As we receive new information, as we receive different information, our opinions change. As we go through new experiences, different experiences, as we see things from a different light or experience things from a different light, our opinions change. The opinions of society changes. We see that in, in society's change opinions on, on sex today from what they were 30, 40, 50 years ago. We see it in, in the attitude to the murder of unborn children, to the, to the, the euthanization uh, of, of the elderly. We see it to the society's attitude towards truth. You know, truth used to be a big thing years ago. It used to matter if, if, uh, if someone lied to you, if your president lied to you, if your prime minister lied to you. It doesn't matter anymore. You know, truth and objective truth and, uh, and believing things that are objective, it doesn't matter anymore. My truth is my truth. Your truth can be whatever you want. The opinions of society change. But God doesn't change. 
Numbers 23, verse 19, we read, God isn't man that he should lie. He's not a son of man that he should change his mind. Hebrews 13, verse 8, speaking about, about Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, God the Son, the writer said, Jesus Christ, he is the same yesterday, he is the same today, he's the same tomorrow. He doesn't change. What he is today, he has always been. God doesn't change with time. His character doesn't change. His beliefs don't change. What he views as sin doesn't change. And the parameters within which sex is to be enjoyed, those parameters that he, he laid down in creation at Genesis chapter 2, they haven't changed. The moral law that he gave to, to Moses on Mount Sinai, 1500 BC, you know, three and a half thousand years ago, hasn't changed. All the things that he commanded, all those things, including adultery that he said were, were sin and weren't to be done, all those things are as much a part of his moral instructions to us today, his ethical code today, as they were three and a half thousand years ago, whenever he gave them. The sexual ethics he gave through Jesus, Mark chapter 10, through his apostles. In the first century, they haven't changed. They apply just as much today in exactly the same way today, the 21st century, as they did in the first century when Jesus or the apostles gave them. And no matter how much our culture changes, God's moral standards, how he wants us to live, what he says is right, what he says is wrong, they don't change. They remain constant. And because God doesn't change, his ethics don't change. And they apply in exactly the same way that they did when he first gave them. And that being the case, we don't adapt, we don't change God's rules, we don't adapt them so that they, they're more palatable to our society, to our, our changing culture. We have no right to do that. They're God's rules, God's ethics, God's commands. Instead, we interpret our changing culture in the light of God's unchanging rules. And we seek to bring our culture to adapt and conform to God's unchanging rules. God's changeless rules on sex and sexuality apply in exactly the same way today as they did at creation and as they did to the sexually immoral cultures of Palestine and the Roman Empire. The Bible's attitude to sin, yes, it may belong in the dark ages. It did belong in the dark ages. But it belongs and applies equally as much in these dark ages. God doesn't change. His ethics don't change. God is good. God is clear. God is changeless. The final... Er, Sorry, God is God. I've given away the fourth one. God is God. God is clear. God has changed us. The fourth truth by which we uphold and, and promote the Bible's attitude to sex is God is good. God is good. See, the desire to abandon the sexual ethic of the Bible is to suggest that God's way of enjoying sex isn't good. It's to suggest that, that there's a better way to enjoy sex. But God's way, well, it's too restrictive. It's too repressive. There's a better way to enjoy sex. God's way isn't good. God isn't good. That's what we're saying. Take what God has, has said, what God has given, throw it out. I know better. I have a better way. God's way isn't good. God isn't good. That's what we're saying. But nothing could be further from the truth. God created sex. He made sex. He made us. He could have made us all, all unisex, but he didn't. He made us male and female. He made us with the ability and, 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 and made us purposefully to enter into and, and enjoy relationships. He made us to complement and complete each other. He made us physical, emotional, 
relational and sexual beings. He made us to enjoy marriage, and he gave us marriage to enjoy. To enjoy. He made us to enjoy sex, and he gave us sex to enjoy. And having created us in this way, with these needs and capacities, he gave us a relationship in which we can enjoy this greatest intimacy and love and relationship that we as humans can enjoy. And having created this wonderful relationship of marriage, he created sex as a way of expressing love and receiving love and enjoying love within that relationship. And having created us in this way, we read it in Genesis chapter, was Genesis 1, having created us in this way and created marriage for us specifically and created sex to be enjoyed within marriage, he said it in Genesis 1.31, he says, very good. Very good, not just good, it was very good, perfectly good, wonderfully good. Sex isn't a dirty thing to God. It's not a bad thing. It's not a nasty thing. It's not something that disgusts him or repulses him. He made it. He gave it to us to enjoy within the marriage relationship that he designed for it, in which we're to experience not only sex, but the blessings of sex. All those blessings that sex was designed to bring to us used and enjoyed in the right way, he sees it as a beautiful thing. A lovely thing, a great thing, a good thing. The Song of Solomon, the whole book of the Bible is given over to rejoicing in the God-given gift of sex. Read it. That's his focus. It is good, the Bible says. A wonderfully good, beautiful gift of God. It's very good. And the confines that that he he places on sex, the relationship within which he says sex is to be enjoyed, again, it's good, very good. You know, God had had wonderfully good reasons for placing sex within within this marriage relationship, within the confines of, of marriage and designing it this way. He didn't just, you know, throw it together. He thought about it. And he had purposes, he had reasons for placing this gift of sex within marriage. You know, enjoying sex within the, the lifelong covenant of marriage, to love each other until death do us part. I am yours and you are mine until we die. I'm committing myself to you. I love you. You do the same to me. Placing sex within the confines of that lifelong covenant relationship removes the fear, the embarrassment, the anxiety that comes with giving ourselves, opening ourselves to another person in this deeply intimate way. That's what you're doing in sex. You're opening yourself emotionally, physically. And the marriage relationship was designed to take away the fear in doing that, the anxiety in doing that. I'm giving myself this. What if they don't like me? What if they reject me? What if, if, in, if in two weeks they, they abandon me and, and leave me for someone else? Marriage was designed to take away that anxiety, a fear. It enables us to, to enjoy this gift without fear of rejection. You know, if, if I do this in a fortnight, He's going to leave me, uh, leave me high and dry, be, be thought of as uh, uh, in all manner of things by my friends. It, it, it enjoys us, it enables us to enjoy the gift of, of sex without fear of, of being used and abused, without being cast off as, as a, an old pair of shoes, being treated as a plaything for someone else just for their sexual enjoyment. The fear of being traded in after a week, after, well, after a night, after a day, a year, two years, however long for a newer model. The pain that comes with that, the emptiness that comes with that, the embarrassment that comes with that, the shame that comes with that, and treated in those ways. Marriage is the only relationship, the only relationship in which we can expose ourselves to that vulnerability without any fear. Some commentators, not commentators, social commentators I looked at, listened to this week, describe marriage as, as a relationship of fearless vulnerability. We're exposing ourselves. We're opening ourselves up. We're allowing ourselves to be, to be vulnerable with someone in an atmosphere of fearlessness. They've accepted me for life. I accept them for, for life. God has given sex to be in, enjoyed within the marriage relationship for a purpose, a good purpose. Sex within marriage wasn't only designed to bring blessing to the husband and wife, but the children produced through this sexual intimacy. It's a way whereby 
Children are, are created and born into the world, conceived and born. And, and the marriage relationship is for their blessing, their benefit, their good. Children are best raised within a marriage relationship, a stable marriage relationship. It's not me saying that. It's not just the Bible saying that. It's not Christian commentators saying that. Non-Christian social commentators will, will bear that out. An, an empirical, rational, easy to find uh, proof. Children are best raised within the marriage relationship. Sex within the marriage relationship was also designed to bring blessings to society, not just for, for the individuals in the marriage, not just for, for the family around which that marriage is centered, but society as a whole. The stability of society, the security of society. You can't just go out uh, tonight, take a woman off the street uh, and, and have her way with her. It's confined to marriage. It's the security, stability, the health of society. Sex and the good blessings of sex are designed by God to be enjoyed in marriage. And when sex is taken outside of marriage, these blessings, at the very best, they're depleted. And at the very worst, they are lost, completely lost, to the detriment of the people you're engaging in sex in this way, to the detriment of any children that are conceived in this way, born into the world in this way, and to the detriment, the damage of society as a whole. God is good. And he has given us a wonderful gift to be enjoyed within a wonderful relationship for many good reasons. I was thinking of, how do you illustrate this? You know, imagine an, an engineer comes up with a new design for, for a new engine, a powerful engine, better than anything else has been before. And the, the power of this engine, is, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Everybody would want it in their car, but it's designed to run on a special fuel, special oil and special fuel. If you don't use a specially designed and engineered fuel, well, it doesn't operate. It doesn't work the way it's designed to. You don't get the power. You don't get the performance. It, it belches smoke. It doesn't run properly. Eventually, it seizes up and dies. Exactly the same way. If you, you don't use sex in the way it was designed to be used, within the marriage relationship, it won't operate. It won't provide the benefits it was designed to bring. The emotional, the relationship, the familial, the societal blessings it was designed to bring. And that being the case, and you say, oh, all right, very, very, very good, Nathan, understand what you're saying. But if that's true, you'd expect to see in society some of the effects of, of people having sex outside of marriage, people um, not, uh, not abiding by the, the sexual ethics of the Bible, the loss of these blessings, that... that when sex is indulgent outside of marriage. And that's exactly what we find, isn't it? Look at society. You don't need to be a social commentator. You don't need to be a whiz kid to look at society and see that the damage that the sex outside of marriage is, is doing to society. You know, instead of the intimacy that the sex was designed to bring, what do we see? We see emptiness. 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 Why is there a soaring suicide rate in such a sexually rampant society? You know, if, it, if it's so wonderful, so fulfilling, why isn't everybody happy? Why are we all so empty? Instead of the vulnerabilities of giving yourself to someone in sex being overcome by the security of marriage, we see these vulnerabilities being lived out very visibly in our society, our culture, don't we? Rejection. One night stand. Rejected. Only wanted you for a night. A fortnight. Gone. Rejected. Heartbroken. Desperate. Tears. Pain. Empty. Been feel, make, made to feel worthless. We see that, don't we? Instead of love, what do we find? We find abuse. Instead of a secure, stable environment for children and the blessings that come with that, we see the damage of, of broken families, one-parent families. Instead of a stable, secure society, what do we have? We have a fractured one. We have a broken one. Research has pinpointed a whole host of societal problems that are associated purely with the breakdown of monogamous marriage, 
one man, one woman for life. A host of societal problems that are based solely on the breakdown of monogamous marriage. A loss of the blessings that God has designed marriage and sex within marriage to bring. Child abuse, domestic violence, crime levels, abuse of alcohol, divorce rates, abortion. Just some. And it's, don't get the impression that this is just research carried out by Christians. By the church, you know, trying to bring our culture back into the folds of the church or, or back into the, 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 the sexual ethic of the Bible. You know, read Louise Perry's book. I, I haven't read it, a brief summary of it, but read Louise Perry's book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, a book that was written by a liberal, uh, a Guardian journalist, you know, a leftist, uh, an author who isn't a Christian, and she argues for monogamous marriage simply on the empirical evidence of the blessings of monogamous marriage that are lost as we consign monogamous marriage to the history books. She says, we've done it at our peril. It's bad for women. It's bad for men. It's bad for children. It's bad for families. It's bad for society. It's bad. And all the evidence shows that. That's what she says. And not coming from the Bible. A non-Christian just looking at all the evidence. The evidence shows that following the sexual ethic of the world and taking sex outside of the God-given parameters of marriage, you will suffer. You will suffer. You might think you're having a good time. It might feel good for a moment. But you will suffer. And society will suffer. God's plan for sex. It's not restrictive. It's not oppressive. It's not harsh. He's done it for a reason. And his reasons are good. But God has given sex. He's given us marriage and sex within marriage for another good purpose. Yeah, husbands and wives, children and society. Husbands and wives... Different but equal, coming together in marriage and sex, the intimacy and, and love within the marriage bond and enjoying sex in that intimate marriage bond is designed to picture God. Designed to picture God, the intimacy, the oneness, the complementary completeness enjoyed by our three-in-one God within the Godhead, our, our different but equal three-in-one God. It is designed to proclaim the love of our three-in-one God within the intimacy of the Godhead. It's one of the things it's designed to picture. And by taking sex out of this one man, one woman marriage relationship, what are we doing? We are distorting that image of God. We're distorting a God-given picture of himself. And even more wonderfully, it's designed not only to picture God, but it's designed to picture the wonderfully intimate relationship that he wants to have with us that we are created to enjoy, fearless vulnerability. He wants us to enter into a relationship of fearless vulnerability with him, nakedness without fear, completely naked, not just physically naked before God, but seeing everything, our minds, our hearts, everything, standing before God naked but fearless, complete opening up and giving of ourselves without fear of rejection, a relationship that brings oneness, that brings wholeness, that brings completeness. That relationship is, is the very pinnacle of existence where we find full meaning in God, full completeness, full satisfaction, our greatest identity. And marriage is designed to picture that. And society today, instead of seeing relationship with God as the pinnacle of life, seeing our relationship with God and who we are in God as, as our, our identity and our meaning and being the bringer of fulfillment and completeness, instead of seeing our relationship with God as that, it looks to sex for that. It says we find our, our identity in sex. We find meaning in sex. We find fulfillment in sex. We find completeness in sex. But we don't. We can't. It, 
It was never intended to be that for us, to bring that for us. It can't do it. It wasn't designed for that. Yes, and in, in, enjoyed within its God-given parameters, it brings wonderful blessings, but, but not the wholeness and, and fulfillment that we crave and society looks for in sex. It was designed to point to the relationship with God in which we find ultimate fulfillment and meaning and our truest identity. And by making sex the ultimate thing, we're taking a God-given gift and we're putting it in the place of God and asking it to give us something that it simply cannot give. And looking for fulfillment in, in God's gift rather than God, however we use or, or misuse that gift, it will only bring emptiness and frustration. It's only in the relationship that is pictured in marriage and sex that we find ultimate intimacy and wholeness. And maybe the, maybe the church is wrong. You know, I go away from my notes on this. Maybe the church is, is wrong in, in how it has proclaimed marriage. The church maybe at times has put marriage at the pinnacle. Marriage, godly marriage, biblical marriage. Uh, they've put it at, at, at the top of the pyramid. Marriage here on earth is not the top of the pyramid. And for, for those who, who aren't married on earth, yes, it, it, it's a gift and, and a blessing of God that you haven't enjoyed here, but you're not missing out on the pinnacle. It's not the pinnacle. It's good, but, but it's not the apex. It's a picture. And maybe, maybe the church has been guilty of, of not pointing people towards the true pinnacle, the best relationship of which marriage is just a picture. <laughs> Looking for fulfillment in God's, this God-given gift. You know, as Christians, looking for fulfillment, or as people just saying, oh, well, I, I can find fulfillment by following God's rules and, 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 and marriage, biblical marriage, and, and giving myself and sex only to, to my wife. That's not the ultimate fulfillment. You won't find ultimate fulfillment in, in following God's rules in that way. It's only in the, the wonderful relationship that, that marriage and, and sex points to. It's countercultural. So countercultural, but in this countercultural sexual ethic, we find the fulfillment that we're all looking for. We don't find it in marriage, that's what, I, that's what I've been saying. We don't find it in sex within marriage, but in the God and the relationship that sex and marriage point to. And by taking sex out of this one man, one woman marriage relationship, we are distorting. The picture, this God-given picture of this beautiful relationship that he invites us into with himself. God is good. You know, young people, don't look at, at the, the, the Bible's, what God's the rules on, on sex and sexual intimacy. God isn't good. He's holding me back from something that I would really like to do. God is good. The rules, the mechanism, the restraints that he has put around, the relationship that he has given to us, which sex is to be enjoyed, it is good. And it's for your good. Society's good. All these blessings, very good blessings, are enjoyed or pointed to in his sexual ethic. And by rejecting it, rejecting the, the relationship with, with him that it points to, we, we deprive ourselves and, and others of these blessings. So can we leave the Bible's attitude to sex in the dark ages where it belongs? Can we? Can we just forget about the, the Bible's sexual ethic and, and consign it to the pages of history? No. God is God. God is clear. God is changeless. And God is good. And if you're struggling with, with God's sexual ethic, either as a young person or someone in your, in, your, in your marriage, and you're struggling with this sexual ethic, either to understand it, or defend it, or to practice it, remember that. God is God. God is clear. God is changeless. And God is good. And in his goodness, he not only provides us with this wonderful gift, we, we looked at this, and I mentioned this in Revelation 21 and 22. God 
has provided us not only with this wonderful gift and a wonderful relationship with him, he also provides forgiveness for all our sins so that we can experience this wonderful relationship with him. All those times that maybe we've, we've broken God's sexual ethic, we've rebelled against his authority, he's provided forgiveness for those sins. When we come to him in humble faith, repentance and faith, and we can enjoy this intimate relationship with him again. And having been brought into this relationship with him, he gives us his spirit to help us submit to him and keep his ethic. God is God. God is clear. God is changeless. And God is good. Amen.